All right, and we are live. Welcome everyone to this very special uh, broadcast that we're doing here. This broadcast is sponsored by Rapid Deploy as well as supported by InDigital. And I am very ex uh, excited and I wanna go ahead and get started. And of course, welcome everyone in here. I'm gonna uh, throw something into the comments and just make sure to have all of you to please share. this post and people are already jumping on already from Facebook and Twitter and this is going to be good I am very excited I've got something right off the bat that I want to share with you um, because this is National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week so thank you all of you for everything that you do this is your week and be proud of what you do because what you do is it's a hard job not many people can do it so I am proud of every single one of you of what you do, and I just can't say enough about what it is that you do within the trenches. So thank you so much for what you do. I'm going to share a video here with you as we start this off and then continue from there. Hi, it's Jessica Rosen Warsaw. I am a commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission, but I'm home and at my dining room table. This National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And I know so many of our nation's 911 officials are at the job answering calls from people in crisis. It's what they do every day, but it's doubly important now that we are facing this pandemic of historic proportions. I'm so grateful for the work our 911 operators do. We should celebrate them not just this week, but every week. And when this crisis is over, let's make sure we truly honor them by making sure the Office of Management and Budget classifies them as first responders. Because before a whistle blows or an ambulance races, there's a 911 operator who is coordinating emergency response. We're grateful for them now more than ever. Thank you. That was awesome right there. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rosen Russell, for, for sending that over. Um, to be able to get out to everyone on the amazing job that they do. Now, it doesn't stop there, though. I've got something special. I've been telling you that I've got this, this um, special broadcast that we're doing, and I see everybody popping in on the comments. Please continue to talk in there and all, and let me bring on my special guest for this broadcast. So here we go. And my special guest is... Hi, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Norma Torres and uh, 911 dispatcher, I should say. Um, although, Ricardo, um, I, I told uh, in advance some of uh, my former colleagues uh, that I was speaking to this week um, that as of April 24th of, uh, of this year, I will be retiring, officially retiring from my position as a 911 dispatcher. Oh, so man. a little bittersweet that <laughs> yes. um, I won't be Congresswoman slash 911 dispatcher. Um, but, you know, every single um, day, you know, their uh, work that they do, um, they're in my heart and I am thinking about them all of the time. Oh, for sure. And, you know, once dispatch, <laughs> always dispatch. And I swear, yeah. every time you and I talk, it's like it's like we're in the dispatch center right there. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of hoping you know, to be able to go back to my 911 center and mm -hmm. do a last you know, shift uh, this month. Unfortunately, uh, because of the coronavirus, um, you know, I'm not able to do that. Uh, but I, it would have been great, you know, to plug in. Uh, one last time and uh, take some 911 calls or or deal with some of the radio um, frequencies uh, issues that they deal with every single day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. There's always there's always something going on. Right. Mm -hmm. There's always something going on. Um, you know, my luck, um, I was always the bomb threat magnet or, oh. <laughs> you know, the suicide, you know, uh, threat magnet. So um, with with my luck. I would be stuck for hours dealing with one of those calls. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, right? And, yeah. and that would be that would be pretty much the way that, you know, the dispatch gods would play it because <laughs> my last week in dispatch, that's the way it was. Everything oh hit the my fan. God. My last shift was a 16-hour shift on overtime. So if you had done been able to do that, 
it's that's probably what happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> so with with all of this, this that's going on, you know, I, I have to say right off the bat, um, a good friend and dispatch legend, Steve, uh, Steve Souter actually posted something on my on my page on Facebook. And he mentions that in 1991, the U.S. Congress designated the second full week of April mm-hmm. as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Yeah. The week draws attention to the nation's approximately 100,000 public safety 911 dispatch personnel who are the first of the first responders. So you recently did a town hall, right? And you were kind yes. of learning everything that's going on right now with with dispatchers and how they're dealing with, uh, you know, with this pandemic. Absolutely. I had an opportunity to be on the phone uh, with 15 uh, PSAPs across the state of California. Um, and it was uh, it was really nice to hear directly from them um, about some of the challenges that, that they're having from, you know, child care, um, and how their uh, 911 centers are, are helping to accommodate uh, the fact that some of their colleagues um, are ill, some of their colleagues have been exposed and have had to quarantine uh, themselves. Um, a couple have gone back to work and just you know dealing with the day-to-day things that we take for granted. Um, I'm here you know at home and, and I'm feeling pretty safe. Uh, but these 911 dispatchers, you know, are the lifeline every day. Uh, and they're talking to people that are ne- not necessarily having, you know, a great day, but it is during their most vulnerable time. And whether we like it or not, crime is still happening. And uh, these unsung heroes are still going to work every day, no matter what, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's an earthquake, um, whether it's coronavirus, they're still showing up and they're still working eight, 10, 12, up to 16 hour shifts mm-hmm. when, uh, when they have to deal with force overtime issues. Right, exactly. I've got a lot of friends um, throughout you know, the United States and in other places where yeah. what they're doing now is a lot of them, you know, they're, before they go into the center, they have to get their their temperature to make sure yeah. you know, their temperature check to make sure that they're not having any symptoms or anything because if something happens within the center then where do we go from there absolutely and, and you know as we uh, begin to um, to hear reports from local governments and state governments about budget deficits um, i can't help it but to think about you know the work of these uh of, of these folks that would not necessarily be exempt from furloughs um, and what that impact looks like for uh, my constituents and for everyday uh, victims. Um, there, there's an extra step that local governments would have to take uh, to ensure that those 911 centers are, are fully um, staffed uh, should, should they, you know, have to force people into furloughs. And given, you know, the state of our economy right now, uh, that is something that uh, is going to um, happen, I would say, in our near future. So we better be prepared. And that is why this 911 Saves Act bill is so important. And I am I'm so um, proud to have so many Republican um, uh, members of Congress join me on this uh, bill because they recognize the important, the importance of their work, as well as senators um, on a bipartisan uh, level. They have introduced, you know, a companion bill um, in the U.S. Senate, and uh, we're waiting for um, for our our committees to take it up and uh, mark it up. You know, it's time. So right. help me put pressure on some of those people. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and this is this is an excellent segue because this is one of the the questions actually that's coming through on the comments here is an update on the Saves Act. Everyone wants to know, you know, what is going on? Is, yeah. is there anything that people should be um, looking at or just how is it even mm-hmm. what's the how is it progressing, I guess? Well, right now, um, because there are no committee uh, hearings that are happening, uh, because members of Congress are, you know, in quarantine themselves, um, you know, the bill has uh, neither of the two bills in the Senate or in the House have been scheduled for a markup. But I think that that should not stop us from talking about it. Um, that should not stop people from 
um, talking about the everyday work that you do. Um, let's get some of those 911 calls, you know, into, into the media and, and let's ask them, you know, to play some of those tapes uh, so that the world can hear what you hear every single day. So the world can be privy to, you know, the feeling, um, the adrenaline that you go through uh, when a crime is unfolding in your ears. When you hear that officer, you know, asking for help um, because they are in a very tough situation, you know, where their lives may be in danger. People need to know that in order for them to understand, in order for, you know, more of my colleagues to understand why is so critically important to recognize you for the work that you do. They have to, they have to listen to some of those calls themselves. And if they're not going to go to your 911 center, then you need to go to them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the best way to do it. And a, a right. lot of dispatch centers are sharing their stories. You know, they, they've got media yeah. coming in and especially this week, there's been right. a lot of stuff going on, but I, I guess one of the other things too is, how do we get those within the same realm to to recognize dispatch um, the way you and I see us, you know, in in um, in fire and EMS um, and and police? You know, a lot of them do, but there are still some that that don't. So how how can we do that? Is it just continuing to share stories and and going to them or having them come to us? Absolutely, continuing uh, to share those stories. Uh, this is a great uh, week for for you to do a media uh, open house um, and invite a camera or two to come in and, uh, and talk to um, your personnel at, at, at the 911 centers. Uh, you know, this, this week, um, I think it was last week, I heard from some of my former colleagues who were um, simply heartbroken um, to read a letter of opposition from, you know, our friends, um, you know, within fire service mm -hmm. on a um, bill uh, that was introduced in the state of California to reclassify them also as first responders. And I said, you know, this is what I've been hearing over the last two, three years in Congress. Um, I'm sorry that, that you're hearing about it for the very first time. I, I've tried to shield you, you know, from some of that. Um, but I think it's important um, to read that letter, and I think it's important to recognize it for what it is. And what it is to me is an uninformed opinion as to the type of work that you do every single day. So join me in helping to inform, you know, our uh, firefighters uh, in in into the work that you do. Uh, maybe they don't truly understand. Um, how you're coping with stress and how it's uh, impacting every, every your life every single day and um, how you are having to go into into work while everyone else you know gets to stay home and how you have to deal with you know chef work um, and all that that comes um, from the work that you do right exactly there's there's so much that mm -hmm. goes into it and and I, and I fully agree it's just People are uninformed. That's why yeah. when when I was in dispatch, you know, I I would go get my hair cut and people right. would ask me, you know, what is it that you do for a living? And I wouldn't know whether to tell them right away, but then, you <laughs> yeah. know, I would mention it and, yeah. and they would say, oh, well, that must be, you know, the a, a real exciting job. Mm -hmm. but that was one of those things as well. You start talking about certain things and they're just simply uninformed as to how it works. In but what I found... Look what I oh, found no in my way. cabinet. It's missing the the earpieces must have uh, you know really worn wore out. But um, right. <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, return this um, you know this month uh, to my 911 center. Um, that is you know, awesome. But this is something that you know we wear. Um, right. You're not you're not picking up you know an old you know dial up phone and 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 talking to folks. Um, you have to be hands free because. That is how critical the work is because you have to listen, because you have to process, because you have to create an incident type, because you have to talk to officers as you're listening to the crime unfolding in your ear. You know, people take that for granted. They think that it happens automatically and it doesn't. And it's up to us to show them how it really happens and, um, and, and why, you know, we need to have 
the most, you know, the best trained um, people answering our call for help. Yeah. <laughs> That, that is awesome <laughs> that you have that and that, yeah. that it has worn out there by the years. That is so cool. Right. <laughs> uh, I, I had the exact same uh, type of headset and all. When you picked up the plug, that's the one I had. <laughs> God, I know. It's just like it really brings back those memories um, right. that uh, only someone in this line of work uh, could understand. Yeah. So you have to turn that in. You can't keep it and like bronze it or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'll have to turn it in. I think they'll, uh, they'll, they'll probably display it in the archives, you know, um, at the LAPD 911 center, they have, they have, um, the old, uh, computers that, you know, were utilized when the 911 system first came up. Mm -hmm. Um, so it'll be, you know, maybe it'll be part of that. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. You know, um, going on with with everything that's, you know, about this week, mm -hmm. do you remember any of the stuff when you were in dispatch? Like, how did you celebrate? Did you guys celebrate a lot of this or yeah. continue working? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this is this was a really special week. Um, and it is for 911 dispatchers. Um, you know, in the last few years that I was there, um, I worked in a special unit um, that you know, was um, tasked to educate the public about the proper and improper uses of 911. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we did just that during this week. We would open it up to guests from the community, um, special guests, actors, and, and you know, different uh, community leaders to come in and see and listen for themselves. But also we would invite uh, the media to come on and, uh, and talk to our, our 911 dispatchers. Um, so, you know, besides all of that, you know, we know how much we love to eat and the potlucks were always great. Um, sometimes, you know, restaurants in the community would uh, take turns and, and, and feed us uh, or officers will barbecue and, you know, bring in um, some goodies uh, for, for us. And I think um, this week is, is that much harder for folks. Um, a lot of the, our 911 dispatchers even though they are at work, they are quarantined at work. So um, a lot of the you know visitors that they would normally get uh, during this week, that isn't going to happen for them. Right. So it's 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 another reason why the general public um, should send them a little note. You know, the mail is a little slow right now. It's you know put a little postcard in the mail for them, but. Whatever you do, don't dial 911. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There, there are a lot of centers that are that are doing things. I'm seeing pictures all over the place, which is mm -hmm. awesome. But then, you know, of course, there are those that that aren't doing anything. Um, yeah. But you know, even even if they're not doing anything, it's that you know, recognition and just words of encouragement. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of different things that they're dealing with. You know, some people that I know. You know, they they have a, a husband or wife who's also working in a different line of public safety and their right. kids aren't there. You know, they're off with grandparents or something and they're they're staying away so that they don't you know have a chance of getting their their kids sick. And that has got to be even more stressful on top of yeah. the job just like that. Absolutely. Um, you know, those are the challenges I think that people forget. Um, it's it's hard enough to get. Um, child care when you're working, you know, shift work um, in the middle of the afternoon or the middle of the night. Uh, and many of, of the 911 dispatchers are single parents, um, you know, single moms that don't have the kind of support um, that, you know, like I had uh, when I was a 911 dispatcher, having a spouse and, you know, and a partner in the household um, to help deal with with the kids and, you know, getting, being the, the taxi parent that, you know, we all need to be, you know, at some point mm -hmm. it was, um, you know, lucky for me that I was able to work the graveyard shift and my husband worked, you know, days so that we can take turns with the kids. Um, but that's, that's a luxury, you know, for many of us. Yeah. I, I worked midnight shift. That was my favorite shift. And yeah. Mid PMs. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, re I think I remember you saying that you were yeah. on midnight shifts and I thought mm -hmm. it would have been fun to work with you. It would have been. I know. 
<laughs> so we're we're coming up on the uh, close to the wrap up of this live broadcast, and I I can't tell you enough. You know, thank you for for coming on, and and for doing this. And, you know, for us being able to get together, you know, this came up uh, just kind of out of nowhere in the last few days. And we were able to get this uh, going together. And yeah. especially for this week, for National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Now, for those who are watching right now, um, we've got a few minutes where if you've got a couple questions, we can take a couple questions. Um, but we're, we're kind of on a tight schedule here. So I'm watching here and i think you know a lot of the questions that were coming up are ones that we already answered and, okay and, right. and, and got to it but um i'm looking to see if there are any others here before we go into this wrap up and while i'm waiting to see uh any any other ones that pop up and all how do you where do you see um you know i guess 911 going you know just kind of a, a general question here the way it's going right now, you know, there's there are people at home, but in some um, some dispatch centers, people are being split up because, you know, maybe there was there might have been an exposure or they're wanting to do it that way just in case. But, you know, the possibilities of being remote and dispatching, mm -hmm. there are a lot of companies out there who are working on this and the technology is there to be able to work remote, you know, kind of virtualize 911. Yeah, uh, I, I know that, you know, they, they've been talking about this, you know, for, I, I want to say centuries. You know? yeah, right. <laughs> I, I remember when I was an I one dispatcher, you know, folks were saying, you know, your job is going to be obsolete. We're going to have um, a computer answer, you know, 911 and you press one for this and two for that. Um, ultimately, I think when you begin to test those systems, um, you realize that, you cannot remove that human component that you have right. to have, you know, a live person uh, talking to someone, you know, through a suicide, you know, um, you know, to prevent a suicide that you have to have that human component, you know, to be able to understand and, and listen to that child as they're reporting um, abuse, you know, whether it's sexual or physical abuse. Um, talking to that, you know, person, that wife, you know, that batter wife uh, goes through, you know, domestic violence and, and that syndrome and understanding that, you know, computers have gotten really, really smart, but they don't have, you know, that feeling, that human component still that is necessary in order to um, handle, process, listen, process, and, uh, and handle these types of calls. Perfect. Now, there are a couple of questions that have popped up here. One of them is, mm -hmm. and, and I think this relates to uh, kind of what you were saying earlier on kind of, you know, getting getting people to look more into, you know, the 91 Saves Act and all. But what can people do locally? Is there anything that they can do locally? Absolutely. Um, you know, contact, uh, you know, your representative and, uh, and and try to help inform them about the work that you do. Um, I think we need to, to, to um, mobilize more of our dispatchers. Um, I said this earlier this week to um, the group that I was talking to, but you know, number one dispatchers, they work so hard and they, they, they go through so much mental stress that when you leave your job, you wanna leave your job behind. And oftentimes we have markers, right? Where you know, we know we have to be a different person on either side of that marker. And, um, but we can't afford to not be at the table. We can't afford to not be the lobbyists that we need to be for ourselves and for this work, critical workforce that is not being recognized and that is not being seen um, for the work that they do. So um, just like me, you know, I had to learn on my own and it was because of a 911 call, you know, that I took a murder of an 11 year old girl that unfolded in my ears. Um, I was dead set that I was not going to allow her to die, you know, without a voice. And I fought for changes at the 911 center, you know, where I work. We, um, the city, city hall um, and our representatives there, recognized that we needed uh, additional funding for our 911 center. And they provided that funding 
But it wasn't because I sat there and crossed my arms or went, you know, to counseling to try to deal with the pain that I was feeling inside as a result. It was because I took action. So now it's your turn. You know, as I as I'm on the other side, it's your turn to pick up that um, and, and, and take some action and speak up for yourselves. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, there were a couple other questions that were coming up here. Um, I'm going to do one last one and then we'll go ahead sure. and wrap this up so that you can continue on with your <laughs> schedule here. Again, yeah. thank you so much. One Absolutely. of the questions here was, do you think that uh, video to 911 at all, because some some places are doing this, do you think mm -hmm. that will play um, you know, a part at all in, in the 911 Saves Act to, you know, to prove even more so what 911 dispatchers do, because now they're going to be seeing all of it as well. Right. I'm very afraid, uh, to be honest, of video to 911, um, because um, the human brain, to be able to um, process all of that, you know, the violence that 911 dispatchers hear um, any given day during an eight hour, 10 hour, 12 hour shift is unlike anything that you could experience. And the PTS, um, you know, issues related to that to to that type of work that they do, you know, are bad enough as they are right now. Um, so I can't even imagine, you know, for uh, some PSAPs that re that you know are in a city like Los Angeles or even New York or Chicago, uh, where there's so much violence occurring every single day, and and it's you know horrific uh, for them to not just hear it but now see it, right? And still get no conclusion because that's part of the problem, the mental anguish that they have is the fact that there is no closure um, for the work that they do. Right. So and I'm a bit leery about that. I, no, I'm, I am yeah. right there with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I am right there with you. Well, also in the comments, a lot of people are, are saying thank you for everything that you're doing and for you know pushing this, for introducing it and just continuing to fight the good fight for, you know, what we used to do. Yep. I will. <laughs> I will. But I need friends in Congress. So, yes. you know, <laughs> you can run yourself just like I did. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much once again for, for coming on and for us to be able to do this for, especially for this week. I, I really appreciate it. And mm -hmm. I am going to, uh, I'm going to have this up for everybody who's watching. It's going to replay here in just a moment on Facebook. Um, but if you have any comments or questions, you can email us. And that's going to be WTTpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter. That is at 91 podcast. And you can like us on Facebook. That is facebook.com slash within the trenches podcast. This will also be available on the podcast 24 seven on Apple. Um, said this word many times now, Apple podcast. <laughs> podcast the word <laughs> and uh google play uh spotify iHeartRadio, and within and uh this was supported by in digital and sponsored by rapid deploy have a good one everyone and thank you again one more time congresswoman torres for joining me thank you ricardo and thank you to all the 911 dispatchers for you know showing up to work every single day perfect thank you